I dreamed up the spiral to teach people about what's safe, what's appropriate when they've only got a cold or uh, a mild virus or, or all those things that we, we, we ought to be able to deal with in an everyday way. So many people go to the doctor for no good reason when they really should be in bed or looking after themselves. And that of course is very personal for me, I have four children and, um, uh, and we are not of a family that very often goes to the doctor. The spiral is really the right way to uh, build a structure that has the right drainage and, and also that you can have the different types of soil at different, at different uh, heights in the spiral so you can plant out different, different herbs. It, it's a very challenging project for me because I, I'm, I'm well known in the family for being able to kill cacti. <laughs> So I, I want to learn throughout this project as much as anything else. My early work has always been on self-care in ancient China. More recently, my interests have been in food and food as medicine and how food and medicine relates, the boundaries of food and drugs. And it's really in that context that I'm, I'm building the spiral. So at the top, I was hoping to put um, alpine herbs up here and we've got pulsatilla which uh, is used a lot in homeopathy and dandelion and chives, all the, the alliums uh, tend to be used as decongestants um, for increasing mucus and in colds, clearing the nose. Lavender everybody knows about, it's, uh, it's clearly calming and um, used a lot in in oils mainly for topical application, but generally picked up now in aromatherapy um, as uh, something to, to use when you've had a hard day. This is feverfew, so this would be extremely good for your headaches. No idea about the research, anything. I think the research shows that it's, it's not particularly helpful, but it has been used for, for centuries for that. This is caraway, which is a digestive. And these are the chamomiles, which uh, again, a digestion but also relaxants, good for sleeping at night. This kind of thing I think hardly needs evidence to go along with it, it's just common practice and will go on forever so long as there is chamomile to be found. This is a Ming materia dietetica of foodstuffs. And so, as you can see, there are beautiful illustrations in these books. But what I'm interested in as a historian is how they came to these ideas in the past, how knowledge was constructed. So, uh, with Chinese medical herbs and Chinese uh, food as medicine, there is this idea of empiricism embedded in the myth mythology. Food is really the basis of um, medicine in many different respects because we eat all the time and certainly uh, the kinds of potencies attributed to food then became attributed to, to medicines. Mm. What are the boundaries between food and medicine? We think it's obvious, but it's not obvious at all. As this project develops, what I hope to see is uh, an outreach project that, that, that really focuses on, on, on children and the care of children and what are the boundaries of what we're able to do as parents for our children. When we have to take them to hospital, what's the point at which it's appropriate to take to hospital? That's not an easy question, you know, when you're dealing with a virus that makes a child look very sick and children uh, look very sick very quickly. So there's a lot of anxiety around that. We do take our children to the doctor too much, we do medicate them too much. So how can we isolate out that really serious emergency from what we should be doing at home, making chicken soup, putting in a bit of ginger to warm them up, or mint teas to cool them down, or uh, the sorts of knowledge that we don't need to go through really expensive trials to uh, establish because, because it's just obvious. <laughs> and uh, our mothers and grandparents knew that. <laughs>